John chapter 3, of course, is a familiar passage. It's because I believe that it houses the greatest gospel message in all the Word of God. I believe it houses also the clearest gospel message. And that's what we're going to look at here this morning. But I don't want to, uh, uh, for, for, this, for this time, I don't want you to pass over the greatest gospel message. Look at verse 16 with me. In verse 16, John three sixteen, you can quote it, but have you realized the Bible says, For God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world, the greatest number, that he gave, that's the greatest act, his only begotten son, the greatest gift, that whosoever, the greatest invitation, believeth the greatest simplicity on him, the greatest person, should not perish the greatest deliverance, but the greatest difference, have the greatest certainty, everlasting life, the greatest possession. The greatest gospel message, I believe, in all the Word of God, right there in John 3.16. And uh, so I encourage you to, to uh, uh, pause on that and thank God that you're redeemed, as we just heard sung, and that we're a sinner saved by grace. And, uh, but as we look at the last verse in John chapter 3, let's begin reading, please. The Bible says, read it aloud with me, if you will. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The message this morning, the title is The Clearest Gospel Message. The Clearest Gospel Message. As preachers, we can take something very clear and sometimes we can smudge it up. Sometimes we can make it confusing. Sometimes um, our tongue gets twisted and, and uh, we don't say the things that we'd like to say. It doesn't come out the way we want. That happens to me quite often. Uh, I, I think I've mentioned here before that when I'm referring to people's weddings, many times I invert those and I will say, make sure and come to Bill and Judy's f wedding. In my mind, somehow funeral comes up. And unfortunately and tragically, just as tragic as that, sometimes whenever I'm referring to a funeral, I put in a place wedding. It's terrible. It, it's, it's an awful thing. And uh, praise God, it's never really come all the way out behind the pulpit, but it has come out in syllable, funeral. And uh, so things happen like that. Anybody, happen to you too? Yeah, I, I, that, that, it, it, does, it does take place sometimes. Um, we had a, a man in our church one of our churches, I'm not going to say which one and where and things, but uh, announcements are where this usually happens the most, announcements. Ladies' retreat. They were going to be having a ladies' retreat at Comfort Suits. <laughs> Comfort Suits. And um, uh, for some reason, he, he, we, we told him it was Comfort Suites, but uh, it just, just didn't come out that way. Sometimes uh, things end up on signs. Uh, or in bulletins in, in strange ways. This bulletin said, Next Sunday is the family hayride and bonfire at the Fowler's. Bring your own hot dogs and guns. <laughs> Another announcement said, The church will host an evening of fine dining, superb entertainment, and gracious hostility. <laughs> Real things. For those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. <laughs> Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Don't forget your husbands. <laughs> now, those are all good announcements, but sometimes they're a little bit unclear. Did you know that people have difficult time uh, giving direction to their own house? Directions can sometimes be unclear. I'm praying that as 
as we have great clarity in this verse, the clearest, the clearest gospel message, I believe, my opinion, is right here in John chapter 3 and verse 36. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the presence of your Holy Spirit here with us. Lord, we want to magnify Jesus Christ, and I know that he's seated there, that right hand of power, position of authority and blessing and honor. And Lord, we bow before you now, asking you that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, enable us, empower us to lift up and magnify Jesus Christ. And you said in your word, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Lord, that's what we want today. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for dying for us upon the cross. Thank you for making your gospel, your good news clear. And Lord, may it be crystal today. Thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Help us as we study it. And Lord, I pray that you would guide us aright. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. In this passage, we're going to unfold a, a few, few words here and uh, I hope be a blessing to your heart as we look at this clear gospel message. Verse 36 says, He that believeth. He that believeth. Now, let's, let's pause here for a moment on this, on this thought of believing. The word has to do with trusting, depending on, relying on. What are you depending on? What are you trusting on for your never-dying soul? God breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And that living soul will spend eternity forever somewhere. Now, we are spiritual beings. God made us that way. He created us that way. And we'll only be satisfied as that spirit then is connected to God's spirit. Until then, someone who is lost... They're trying to fill that void with everything possible that they can stuff into that hole in their heart. But my friend, there's only one person that can satisfy the longing of your soul. His name is Jesus Christ. And we have to depend upon him, rely on him, and have our faith in him. He that believeth. Now, uh, you, might, you might get a little confused on some things. You might read the scriptures and you might see over and over where the demons and the devils of hell, as Jesus was casting out uh, uh, demons that had possessed people, you might see how that they announced who he was. They knew who he was. Over and over, he said, uh, he said to them to hold their peace whenever he announced that he was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They knew who he was. They had a knowledge of who he was. Knowing of Jesus merely tells who Jesus is. You may know who Jesus is, but that's not what the Bible is talking about here. Believing on Jesus clearly trusts who Jesus is, not just tells who Jesus is. You can go out and, and, and buy a Bible and, and read, read the Word of God, but until you surrender your heart, to the lordship of Jesus Christ, that he is king of kings, lord of lords, he is the savior of all mankind, and I'm a sinner in need of a savior, and you put your faith and trust believing in him, my friend, you might know a lot about Jesus, but knowing a lot about Jesus will not gain you entrance into heaven. Amen. Knowing affects the head, believing affects the heart. Knowing affects our intellect. Believing affects our actions what we will do. Say, well, what do we need to do? The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be, what's the word? Saved. Saved. Believe. Believe. What are you trusting in for your eternal salvation? If you've been baptized, we congratulate you. If you're a member of, of a good Bible preaching church, we're, we're glad for you. If you can quote Bible verses and you have awards for attendance, that's admirable. But my friend, none of those things will get you one moment into, inside the pearly gates of heaven. Only the shed blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I was so, so thrilled when uh, Wade's son, I, I, said, I asked him, I said, what can wash away your sin? 
And he, boy, he had in his heart nothing but the blood of Jesus. Believe, believe, knowing, not knowing, not just merely having an understanding, but believing on Jesus. And then the Bible says, He that believeth on the Son, capital S, the Son, S-O-N, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Now, the Son, who is the Son? That is the eternal, everlasting Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. Some people challenge that. May I remind you, Mark chapter 1, verse 1 says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Gabriel announced him as the Son of God. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. John the Baptist announced him as the Son of God in John 1, 34. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Uh, Nathaniel said it. Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Peter said it, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, over and over and over. But yet some people actually have the, the audacity to say that Jesus himself did not claim to be the Son of God. Other people uh, ascribed that to him, but that Jesus himself did not claim to be the Son of God. John chapter 3, verse 18, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. And he says, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He is speaking of himself. We find in John chapter 11, verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, the sickness is not unto death, speaking of Lazarus, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby over and over, referring to himself as the Son of God. In fact, whenever he was standing before uh, the high priest and the charges were being leveled against Jesus Christ, the greatest charge that was leveled was that he, he said that he made himself to be the Son of God. The enemies picked up on it. They knew it. He was not crucified for what he had done. He was crucified for who he was. John 20, verse 31 this is a great verse. I, you're in the Gospel of John. Would you turn with me, please? I love to hear pages turn in the Bible. This is a great verse. John chapter 20 and verse 31. The Bible says this, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. The blessed name of Jesus. Oh, they wrote the song, beautiful, Jesus Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name. The Son of God, believing on the Son of God. The Bible says, he that believeth. By the way, he means also he, she, all of humanity, anyone. It could be a five-year-old child. It could be a 95-year-old grandpa. If you have breath in your lungs, if you have a, a beating in your heart, we often say it's good to see you on the green side of the dirt. Because there is going to be a day and a time when this ticker is going to stop. And we're going to draw our last breath. Did you hear the announcement before, before the, the music? Did you hear Pastor Tim as he quoted from James? Take your hand out. Hold it right in front of your face for a moment. Would you do that? Now... Blow at your hand. That's your life. It's a vapor. You don't even see it. You just felt it for a moment. That is your life. Where is your trust? What are you believing in? Some of you would say that you have state farm insurance or prudential insurance or or uh, progressive insurance, or uh, liberty mutual insurance. You get all these kinds of insurances, and you don't really know if they're even going to pay. You know? But yet the God of the universe makes you a promise that's ironclad, it's golden clad. It's covered in the blood of Jesus, sealed by his promise and his love. And yet, some people still have not made their reservation in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Now, what is everlasting life? That is forever and ever without end. 
You're going to live somewhere forever. Jesus said in John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. From death unto life. John eleven twenty five 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall never die. Oh, wait a minute. My grandma, she was a Christian, loved the Lord, served Jesus all her life. She died 10 years ago. As far as you're concerned, she died. As far as you're concerned, she died. But you see, as far as God's concerned, I mean, she just moved from one house to another. As far as God's concerned, by the way, what, what God what God thinks is what really matters, okay? And he said, you'll never die. But he also says that those who are lost without Jesus Christ, that we're dead already. Because we're separated from God before we're saved. The clearest gospel message. Uh, it could be rivaled. A person might, might, might argue saying, you know, I think there's another verse that's the clearest gospel message. You might say it, it, it's in 1 John 5, 12. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. All one syllable words. It's simple. If you have Jesus, you have life. That's just all there is to it. Everlasting life. Now, let's, let's read on, and, and we'll, we'll pull all this together in just a moment. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. We're just studying God's Word here this morning. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. I mean, you're not even going to see it. It won't be something that you can even attain to, try to make. You won't even be in, within, within reach of it. Shall not see life. And here's the, here's the striking part. But the wrath of God abideth on him. The wrath of God. Oh, yeah. You preachers, you just love to preach hell, fire, and brimstone. Well, I, I call your attention to something. Jesus did preach more about hell than he did about heaven. He did. You can look it up and you can study it for yourself. I do believe because he did not want any single person to go there. Because he created it for the devil and his angels, not for human beings. He did not want anyone, any soul, any human being to spend eternity in a lake of fire. The wrath. Nahum 1, 2, listen to this. God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Wow. Jeremiah 10, 10. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. Oh, preacher, I know. That's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. And, and we're New Testament. We're New Testament believers. And that thing of, of God being angry and things, that's, that's the wrong persona to give uh, for Jehovah God, uh, for, for the, the heavenly Father up in heaven. Okay, let's see what the New Testament has to say. I'll give you just two verses. Romans 1.18. Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of God. How about this one? Ephesians 5, 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. I'm so thankful that our God is a God of love. I'm so thankful. But the other side of the coin of his nature is that as he loves his children and as he loves those who serve him, those who sin, the Bible says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. For the wages of sin is death. You've got to have the positive pole on a battery and a negative pole on a battery 
to get an engine to start. You've got to have them both. And the gospel message has to have the love of Jesus Christ sent by the Heavenly Father to die for our sins so that we would not go to the, receive the wrath and the judgment of Almighty God. You have to have both to have that message of salvation. The good news. My friend, if there was not a hell to miss, if there was not an everlasting fire to shun, then why would the gospel be good news? My friend, the Bible tells us here that the wrath of God abideth on him. It's interesting, the tense of the verb. It is present tense. It is present tense. Abideth right now. The wrath of God abideth on those that bear the penalty of their own sin. Say, well, what's, what's, what's the hope for me? Well, I'll tell you. Nature forms us. Sin deforms us. Prisons try to reform us. Education informs us, informs us, but only Jesus Christ can transform us. Only he can. And this thought of this word remission, remission, the remission of sin, the word means the cancellation of a debt, the cancellation of a charge or a penalty. When someone pays something in full, Matthew 26, verse 28, Jesus said, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Jesus' blood was shed to cancel the sin debt that I owed and that you owed. He died for the sins of the entire world. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed, Oh, Father, let this cup pass from me. What was he talking about? He was talking about my sin that was put in that cup, your sins that were put in that cup, the sins of the entire world. He had never committed one sin, never had one evil thought, never said one crossword. And yet he took your sins and mine and the filth of this world and he took it upon his body and then took the judgment of God that you and I deserved and he took it upon himself. There hang on that cross, suspended between heaven and earth. And he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There are people today who in John chapter 3 would identify with, with something. You find early in John chapter 3 that there was a man who came to Jesus by night. Tell me his name. Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to him, sneaking around, didn't want to be seen by his peers, was afraid of what might be said. And by the way, that's what happens a lot of times with human beings. You know, we're just, just kind of afraid what somebody else might think. We think that that really matters. What is your life? It's even a vapor. The rest of the time, we're standing before God. But he did come to the right person. He came to Jesus by night. And he began bragging, you know, on the things that he had done. And Jesus said, except you be born again. That was the whole crux of the message. You were born in sin, you got to be born again into the family of God. And he got across a message that there's no remission through religion. There's no remission through religion. My friend, this church does not dole out remittance tickets to go to heaven. There's no way for us to give you a get out of jail, get out of hell free card. The Baptist denomination doesn't have that. The Catholic church does not have that. The Methodists, the Presbyterians don't have that. Only Jesus Christ has that. No remission through religion. And as you study in chapter 3, you move on and you, and you, you, you see the testimony of another man. And we find in John the Baptist that there's no remission through relation. Do you realize, humanly speaking, John the Baptist was on the human side related to Jesus. Now, 
in this life, in this world, who you know matters. Who you're related to can get you out of a jam. But as far as before the, the thrice holy almighty God, we stand on our own two feet. We don't stand behind a preacher. We don't stand behind a, a, a godly mother. We don't stand behind a church. We don't stand behind a, anything that we've done. My friend, we stand our own two feet. No remission through relation. John the Baptist, he, he, he goes on and gives testimony throughout this passage. If we had time, we'd, we'd look at it. I encourage you to, to uh, study this. And you see, it is, it is his voice that is giving this message in verse 36. The Holy Spirit is, in, is, is giving him this message when he gives this in verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. There's no remission through religion. We learned that from Nick the Pharisee. No remission through relation. We learned that from John the Baptist. And there's no remission without redemption without someone paying the price, without someone making the sacrifice. In the Old Testament, we, we're told in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, that the, Old, that the Old Testament sacrificial system was a shadow of things to come. Now, a shadow is something just two-dimensional, something without color, something that just gives an outline of something that is real. And every time that they took the spotless lambs, and every time that they, that they shed the blood at the altar, it was, it was a shadow of the cross of Jesus Christ. When he would die, when he would shed his precious blood, that John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. There on the same mount, centuries before, God told Abraham, he said, I will provide myself a lamb. God will provide himself a lamb. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without shedding of blood is no remission. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Now, the clearest gospel message is simply this. I deserve to go to hell. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner by nature. I'm a sinner by choice. I sin because of a sinful nature. But I chose to sin, and I choose to sin in my life, and that sin before a holy God must be judged. If someone who is guilty, who appears before a court of law, and the judge acquits him, and it is known that he is guilty. And for some reason, that judge sets that person free. What do you think of the judge? He hasn't done his job. The law must be satisfied. And although God is a God of love, and although God wants to show mercy, also the law of Almighty God must be observed and must be fulfilled. And so the soul that sinneth it shall die. Before the foundations of the world, the Bible says, in the heart and mind of God, the plan of redemption was put into place so that Jesus could die for your sins and for mine. And the sins of the entire world, I don't know how, how God did it, but he took the sins of the entire world and he placed it upon Jesus Christ, just as the, as the high priest would symbolically place his hand upon the head of that lamb as he was about to slay the lamb as a sacrifice for one year for the sins of the people. And he would place his hand there. My friend, God himself punished his only begotten son for my sins and for yours. And if I believe that, and if I believe that he died for me, if I believe that just as he said he would, he arose from the grave victorious over sin, victorious over the grave, and he stands 
to give the gift of salvation to you and to me. What would you think of Almighty God if someone said, I don't want that? You know, I'm too busy right now, God, but, but later on, when I have time, when I settle down, I've had my fun, later on, God, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll think about this thing of salvation. It's a good thing. I should do it. You're right. And I am a sinner. I'm just not going to do it right now. And he goes out into the world, or she's go, she goes on with her life, not knowing that two months later, her life is over. His life is done. My friend, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. I tried to make this as clear as possible. Say, so well, what do I need to do? First of all, you don't do what I'm telling you to do. If God is drawing you, you listen to Him. You listen to His Holy Spirit. He's convicting you of sin. He's telling you that is true. That is right. What the preacher is saying is true. You're going to spend eternity in the flames of hell. But I love you so much. I died for you. And I can give you the gift of salvation. I can give you a little bit of heaven on earth right now. I'll be your best and dearest friend. You can go to me in prayer anytime. I'll speak to you through, through my word, my love letter to you. I'll reunite the creation with the creator. That's what I'll do. But you have to come in repentance of your sin and ask and believe in Jesus Christ. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Right now. The only thing keeping and holding back that wrath in its fullest form is boom, 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 boom. It's the only thing. My friend, I don't know how to make it any more clear. Sometimes I've gotten bad directions to go places. You know, and I've ended up in circles. I was driving the other day in Deltona to visit a dear family. I don't know. I'm looking around. I'm, I'm trying to see if they're here. And uh, there they are right back there. And uh, there was a terrible thing happening uh, right kind of in their neighborhood. And the police had, it, had all the roads blocked off. This was on Friday, on Friday. And they had the roads blocked off. You may have seen something about it in the news. And I, and I, I pulled up beside the cruiser there and after driving around a little bit and realized that, that there was no way to get there that I could find. And, uh, uh, and, and this, this officer lady, she, she said, there's something really bad going on. We can't let you through. I thought, wow, okay. Um, so um, I thought, hmm, get out my little phone, my little GPS, you know, and, and uh, if you go a certain, certain, you know, little direction, they'll recalculate, right? <laughs> the only thing worse than being lost is being lost in Deltona. And I went and, and turned left at this street, turn left at this street, turn left at this street, turn left at this street. That equals a circle. <laughs> and I was lost. I was thinking, how in the world can I get there? I opened up that screen a little bit further, and I see this great big lake, and I can't get to where I'm going because of that great big lake. And I looked, and on the map, I, I saw one way, one way, and I went around that lake, and finally, the GPS decided, oh, okay, he wants to go this way. <laughs> All right. And then it guided me in. You're going to hear a lot of voices about how to go to heaven. I have a lot of opinions. My friend, you better open up this map right here. Or open up this map. Better see what God has to say because he is right every time. Every time. 
and he loves you. He proved it. He died for you. The only thing you have to do is come to him with a humble heart. Say, God, I need your forgiveness. I need your salvation. I believe everything that you say. I'm trusting you today. Will you do that today? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. No one is looking. If you would say, Pastor, God is speaking to my heart. What do I do about it? What do I do about this? Would you just simply, as an expression towards God, would you pray this prayer and ask Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and save your soul? If I were in your home, sitting on your couch, talking with you eyeball to eyeball, this is what I would say. I would say, if you will trust Christ as your Savior today, as best you know how, God will hear your prayer and he will save your soul. Would you pray this from your heart and mean it? Right now, this morning. Just something like this. You don't even have to pray it big and loud. You can whisper it right where you're at. You say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe in you as my Savior. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead for me. And I ask you to forgive my sins. Come into my heart and my life and save my eternal soul. I'm trusting you, Lord Jesus, to take me to heaven when I die. Thank you for saving me.